Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna try and answer the question, is it worth paying a premium to get the unlocked K Intel CPU over the non-K variant when building your own PC? Let's get right into it. So recently, I had a really tough purchasing decision. I was trying to debate between several different Intel CPU models. Should I go with the i7-11700 non-K, which cost around $340 at the time? But then I had all these other questions in my head, all these other options. How much performance am I going to sacrifice if I don't buy the K version? Or perhaps should I go with the last year's 10700K, which cost only $325, which is actually $15 cheaper than the 11700. Just trying to look at all the numbers and specs available to the average consumer on their website, the 10th gen does look a little bit better because one, it is overclockable. Number two, it does have a higher clock speed when it's turbo boosted. And number three, it has the same amount of cores, eight as the 11th gen. Now, yes, I'm fully aware that the 11th gen has double digit IPC gains. Apparently it's only geared towards productivity, which is really good in my case. And IPC just stands for instructions per clock. So that means it can just process a lot more with the same amount of cores. Now, despite all the IPC gains in the 11th generation chips, I was still wondering to myself, could a 10700K overclock beat a stock non-K uh, 11 gen, like 11700 chip? If that's the case, the fact that a 10700K could still beat a non-K 11700, what kind of cooling would it need? How much more of a premium would I have to pay? Maybe I have to get a 280 liquid AIO cooler, which would you know add more to the cost. Now, apparently you could overclock an 11600K to kind of just match the performance of an 11700 or even the 11900, which is pretty ridiculous, but of course it's gonna have two fewer cores. So as you can see, this is all very confusing and there are just so many different variations that you could buy. Now, of course, if my budget wasn't a concern, I would just not think twice about it and not try to squeeze every penny. I would just go ahead and buy the 11700K, pay that extra $60 and just be done with this whole dis uh, purchasing decision. But I was wondering to myself, is it really worth that extra 18% cost to buy an unlock Intel chip in this case of the 11700, especially if I do not plan on overclocking. By the way, I'm gonna explain a little bit later why I prefer to keep it at stock speeds rather than overclocking. So assuming that you are gonna be sticking to the a stock configuration and that you have a mid-range motherboard that ignores all the turbo limits, basically you don't have a OEM pre-built motherboard, will you get that 18% CPU performance? Well, that's what I'm gonna try and answer because all the mainstream media like Gamers Nexus or Linus Tech Tips all talk about K CPUs. And there's such little, very little information that talks about non-K, especially when comparing it in benchmarks. So before we dive into the details, I wanna quickly explain why this video is primarily focused on Intel CPUs and not the beloved AMD CPUs, which apparently are better value. Firstly, I've just been using Intel all my life, so I guess you can say I'm a little bit more biased or a fanboy towards Intel. Second, I just don't have all the time in the world to research all the intricacies and differences of another platform like AMD. And lastly, Intel CPUs have a very powerful hardware feature called QuickSync, and this helps decode and encode H.264 and H.265 codecs, which are primarily used when I'm editing in Adobe Premiere. Now, I just wanna mention a quick note about QuickSync and how you get it. First of all, you have to buy an Intel chip that does not have the letter F in it. If you buy one with the letter F in it in its SKU, that means you're not gonna get a free graphics card basically, although it's not the greatest graphics card, but it's definitely something that is very, very handy to have. So not only do you get QuickSync, which helps you know make things really smooth in Adobe Premiere, it allows you to debug issues. Let's say maybe you broke your graphics card, it's not working properly. Maybe, maybe you can just switch to onboard GPU and just isolate um, what, what is broken. Another, in, in our current climate of GPUs, it's very hard to get one. So maybe you just wanna build something and use the iGPU on the simple, uh, Intel chip. It's very handy to have. Now, it only costs about $10 more to, to get the non-F version. So I definitely recommend always when you buy an Intel chip just to get that onboard GPU just in case. So in the latest version of Adobe Premiere, it actually turns out that NVIDIA graphics cards can do most of the hard work of encoding and decoding codecs on the fly to make your timeline a lot more smooth. Now you still get the benefit of using both QuickSync and NVIDIA at the same time when you're exporting videos. One will encode and the other will decode, and this makes the whole experience a lot more efficient. So if you don't have an NVIDIA card, maybe you got an AMD instead, then having QuickSync is extremely helpful. And even if you do have NVIDIA uh, graphics card, it's gonna be very handy to have when you wanna work both the video card and the quick sync technology in tandem. So for the next section, I wanna give some general advice when it comes to buying an Intel CPU. There are two items that you really wanna consider when you're buying, let's say, an i5, an i7, or an i9, anything that's higher than an i5, basically. 
you definitely need a decent aftermarket cooler and you also probably want a decent motherboard that removes all the pyro limits. Now for air cooling, if you don't plan on overclocking, then maybe spending around $60 for a cooler is totally fine. And in this case, I'm using the U12S. If you buy the regular non-K version of any Intel chip, they're gonna give you a free complimentary stock CPU cooler. Please do not use that one as it is very bad and it will not allow you to reach the full potential of your i7 or i9 processor. So let's talk about my example. I'm running Cinebench R23 on my 11700 with unlimited power limits and it's running at a full 135 watts and the CPU never goes over 65 Celsius. That's the reason why I don't want to overclock because it can really affect the stability of my production workflow such as getting that blue screen Adobe Premiere crashing my entire project. And to get that extra 100 to 300 megahertz, you just need so much more power and there's really diminishing returns. It's not linear to get that extra power. You need to really bump up the wattage. Thus, it's gonna require more expensive cooling, which adds to the cost. So I don't have all this time to tinker, go into the BIOS and play with the voltage and run stability tests. I hope this explains why I have a preference to not overclock, even if I get a K CPU, which is unlocked. Now, as for motherboards, just make sure you get a decent mid-range motherboard that unlocks all the power limits so that you're not running at the you know base clock speeds of you know 2.5 gigahertz. Now you don't need like a high-end motherboard like an Enthusiast Z590, especially when the mid-range B60 motherboards let you unlock the XME profile for your RAM so you can overclock it. Just double check the manual for your motherboard and just make sure that there's an option to enable multi-core enhancement, which pretty much moves all the power limits. Now, if you get a Dell or a pre-built PC, be warned that some of their motherboards may not have sufficient power delivery for an KXQ Intel chip, and it might not even have the option to unlock the power limits. So you might have to use extreme tuning utility from Intel to do such a thing. So what's the difference between a K and non-K CPU beyond just the paper specs? Well, it all has to do with the quality of silicon you're paying for. Now, Anden Tech did a really detailed analysis on this, and based on their test results, they found that a non-K CPU will run hotter when all the cores are engaged. This means that if you buy a non-K CPU, you technically have a less efficient CPU that will run hotter. In fact, Intel has deemed this chip to be unstable at higher speeds, and therefore has binned this as a non-K variant, obviously. So fundamentally, at the end of the day, in the case of the 11700 versus the 11700K, if you're a consumer who bought a motherboard that ignores the power limits and you don't want to tinker around and overclock your CPU and do all that stuff, and you just keep everything at stock, you are paying an 18% premium for an extra 200 megahertz for all core turbo boost. That translates to plus 4.5%. And you also get an extra 2% improvement, about 100 megahertz for the single core boost. Now that 4.5% boost is applied to all eight cores. So it does make a difference. And we'll talk about that later in our benchmarks and we'll see that maybe the 18% premium may be worth it. So when it comes to Intel marketing and just trying to be able as a consumer, just see their specs online, it gets really confusing because their base clock speeds, their TDP rating, you know, everyone talks about it. It's just very annoying because their TDP rating is very confusing. It's based on the base clock speed, which is which are ridiculously low. For example, an 11700 shouldn't should never go to 2.5 gigahertz. That would be ridiculous. Maybe if you use the stock cooler, that's the case that would happen. They mainly do this so that they can appease their OEM distributors, so that you know they can put crappy hardware in there and still technically be under the warranty. What I also find very annoying is that if you go onto your online website. It's very difficult to locate the all core turbo boost for all the chips. So it's very, it makes it more difficult to kind of compare them and maybe they don't want to show this information. Maybe they want to obfuscate it because it just makes it more confusing for the customer, which I feel is scummy marketing tactics. Okay. So let's finally get to the benchmarks and the final conclusions for all of this. Now I'm going to be running all of this at stock configuration, unless otherwise noted, as you can see in the diagram below, and we'll be running Citibench R23. So for the first one, we're going to look at the 10700K and it scored around 1200 points and that's not bad. It costs 325 US dollars. And now let's compare that to the 11700 non-K version, which is priced very similarly, just $15 more at $340. And as you can see for $15 more, which is only 4.2% more, we get a nice gain of about 15.5%, which is, you know, you're, you're paying 4% more money for 15% more performance. So that is an obvious no brainer. 
Now, obviously this is a K variant and I did not overclock it. So if we overclock the 10700K, it's very probable that we could recoup that percentage difference and maybe get an extra 10% out of performance and that would close the gap. So it is cheaper and it's possible to close the gap, but you do need better cooling. So with my 11700, I'm just using a $60 cooler, the Noctua U12S, and that keeps it very cool when it's fully maxed out without any turbo limits at 130 watts. Now for the next section, let's compare the 11700 non-K to the 11700K version. When we compare the 11th gen i7 unlocked CPU versus the locked processor, we can see that the K variant has a mere 4% gain in performance, as predicted by the extra 200 MHz during an all-core turbo boost. At this point, you may squawk at the idea of paying nearly 18% more money for the K unlocked variant for a measly 4% improvement. However, the real value of getting an Intel K CPU is achieved by overclocking the K chip, but that requires you to go out and buy in a more expensive Z590 Enthusiast motherboard and have a slightly more expensive cooling solution. You can see that the overclocked 11700K at 4.9 GHz all-core turbo boost is given a more impressive 13% improvement over the non-K variant, and you could probably push the overclock even more to close the gap of the price premium versus the price performance. That would overall justify that 18% price premium if you are willing to overclock. And in the case of my 10850K, which has 10 cores, it's gonna run a little bit better. It's about the same speed as an 11700 overclock to 4.9 all-core turbo boost. And it's the same price as well. So obviously I would prefer to have the 10850K. And it seems like the IPC improvements per core for the 11th gen is definitely helping with its deficit of two cores compared to the 10, last year's 10 gen. So it does stack up, but we had to overclock the 11700K. In our case, the 10850K was not overclocked. Lastly, we'll look at 3D Mark CPU scores. Here we can see that the stock 10700K beats the 8th gen 8700K by a whooping 37% to give a sense of what a two generation improvement looks like. Now comparing the 10700K at stock configuration to a locked 11th gen i7 CPU, we can see that the 11th gen chip is performing admirably well at a 10% improvement over the 10700K. Now, as I mentioned before, with a little bit of overclocking, we could probably push the 10700K to, this, to the performance of a 11700 non-K variant. Lastly, the i9-10-85K absolutely destroys by beating the 11700 by 17%, which is expected because the i9 cost about 17% more over the 11700. And of course, we can overclock the 1085K to get even better performance, but that would require much better cooling in my small form factor build. So to wrap this up, too long didn't watch. In the end, you get what you pay for. I think paying that extra premium for the K variant is not a bad idea, especially if you are forced to buy an enthusiast motherboard because you had to buy it as a bundle to get an RTX 3070, which I did. Thank you, Canada Computers, for ripping me off. Now, unfortunately, it does require some extra cooling, so you may need to factor that into your cost. So it really depends on what you want to do. Even if you don't overclock, I think getting a K variant CPU is not a bad deal at all because you know you're you're you have that potential to overclock in the future, even though you're not going to get the full benefit right away. You'll just need to you know learn a little bit about how to overclock in your BIOS and perhaps sacrifice some stability. I'm not sure, but I've had some really poor experiences in Adobe Premiere when trying to overclock an 8700K without adequate cooling. Thank you, Dell OEM. Now, if you were to ask me personally, was it worth to not get the K version and just buy a regular 11700? I would have to say yes. In the end, I'm quite satisfied with the cost savings of getting the normal 11700, since it's only performing 4% less than the K variant at stock speeds. And also, I don't wanna go through all the trouble and hassle of having to overclock in the BIOS and then risk system stability, especially in Adobe Premiere, and then I have to go out and buy a more expensive cooler. So even though buying the K variant can be justified if you do all the overclocking, I was, my main goal was to more save money and also save my time. So that's it for this video. I hope that concludes everything. I was just, I had to make this video because there are so many videos, so much misinformation of these tech gurus saying, they were saying something like, nah, you don't need to get the K version. And they had no numbers to back it up. They're just like, you know, 200 megahertz, 100 megahertz increase in for the single core. And then no, nah, it's, it's, it's like 
I mean, no, that you can see that the data shows that there's some decent improvements if you get the K version. Anyways, that's it for now. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.